Good morning, Merry Christmas. That was so 2010, but pretty funny, right? <laughs> all, the, all the people in here who are like Generation Z or Alpha are like, what is going on? But for us old timers, that was some sweet memories. Well, it is a Merry Christmas. Um, if you watch the Hallmark Channel, Christmas started in October. At the end of October, my wife, who loves the Hallmark Channel, was watching a Christmas sh- show, and I said, babe, I said, it's, it's not Christmas yet. She said, baby, it's always Christmas. It's always Christmas with Hallmark. Well, we're taking a four-week break from the book of John. Just four weeks, we'll be back. And instead, this Advent season, we're going to look at the, the Christmas story, the story of the incarnation, the birth of Jesus. And what we want to do is we want to examine it through the eyes of, of the people who experienced it. What did it mean to them? How did they respond to the news that God had had sent the rescuer king into the world? And so what we'll do is we'll look at several different people who are told about the good news in different ways and different responses. Their different responses will look at how they respond to the good news. So the cast of characters associated with the story of Jesus' birth is colorful and memorable. Usually we recognize them by their unique speaking parts, which we will cover starting next week, over the next three weeks. But oddly enough, only Joseph has no speaking part. He is the lone silent member of of the cast and is often forgotten. Mary is amazing. We're like, oh, Mary, you're amazing. And oh, yeah, you're married to that guy. What's his name? So we're going to hear angels bring uh, heavenly greetings. Mary sing a praise, praiseful solo. Herod condemn. Wise men worship. Shepherds preach. But Joseph is silent. No notable lines are attributed to him. No sound bites. No quotes. Only silence. So um, we start this morning with Joseph. Do me a favor. If you haven't already, please turn in your Bibles or your Bible devices. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be, to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she'll give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they They'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Nowhere in these verses do we hear Joseph's voice. In fact, as we search the the Gospels, we discover that they do not contain even a single word uttered by the mouth of Jesus's earthly father. But as we all know, more often than not, actions speak much louder than words. So three observations from our our text this morning. Observation number one will be about about Joseph. Observation number three will be about Joseph. Sandwiched in between, we'll just dive just briefly into the incarnation. First observation this morning, we see that Joseph was a righteous man. Verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to to be married to Joseph. Mary, most likely between 13 and 15. Joseph, most likely between 17 and 19. And we need to stop here for a minute and explain what does it mean to be pledged to somebody because this isn't language that we use in our culture today. Our version says pledged to be married. Other versions call it betrothed. Um, This was the Jewish custom called kiddushin. A young man and his fiancee would get legally married. Just a piece of paper. Just go before a judge, so to speak. But then they had to to wait a year before they were allowed to, to live or and sleep together. 
which by the way has to be the, the dumbest tradition ever invented. Ruth and I were engaged for five and a half months and it was pure torture. I mean sweet memories, but pure torture, right? The parents um, would pay the price that they wanted to make sure that the girl was pure. This was the condition, and they would, they would require a year of waiting before you could, you could live or sleep together. Um, and obviously, after 12 months of waiting, you would know if she was pregnant or not. If she was pure, then you would have a public ceremony called the, the Nishuin. So the Kiddushin is the, the legal one-year waiting period, making sure you're pure, you're, you're married. You're technically married, but you don't live together. You don't sleep together. The Nishuin, which would be what we're used to when we see a, a Jewish wedding, right? Um, the bride and groom would come under the, the hoopah. And the hoopah would be like that, that covering. And that, that was to symbolize the covering of God to protect their marriage. And then they would throw down the, the glasses and they would step on them and they would say what? Mazel tov. And you're like, why do they step on the glasses and break the glasses? Underneath the protection of God, they broke the glass. The glasses signified that life is fragile. And only God can restore it. Marriage is fragile. So you, you got the, the, the hoopah, the mazel tov, And then they would all, all go off and lift the bride and groom up on chairs. And they would dance the hora. And they'd go, yadi da di da Remember that? And then they would be married. And then they'd live together. And then they'd have marital relations. But in every other way, during the betrothal, the kiddushin, you were considered to be married. And to get out of the kiddushin, you had to get a legal divorce. So this is very, very serious. Verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant um, through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. Underline that. That's just verbiage for he was righteous. This isn't a legalistic term. This is a, this is, um, a spiritual term. To be faithful to the law meant one who, who, not perfectly, but kept the laws of God. And when you kept the laws of God, you love God, you love others um, more than yourself, when you did that, you were considered righteous. Joseph was a righteous man. He was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, but had in mind to divorce her, rip up that kiddushin quietly. So we're introduced to Joseph in the middle of a crisis, a personal crisis. Having um, become engaged to a beautiful young girl, he has work, worked hard to establish an income to support his, his new bride and to begin a new family. And he's in love and he's committed to, to marry. And he's got a ton of expectations and a ton of joy and a ton of happiness, right? He's, he's pumped. He, he believed that she, she loved him until the news that she is pregnant. And it's not him. Heartbroken and betrayed. How, how should he respond. He's got a couple options here. He can publicly shame her. He can just say, hey, the kiddushin has been broken and I'm making a public announcement. She is to be shamed forever in this community, which was a really, really big deal. Um, he could have turned over to the authorities to potentially, now this was less and less uh, during the Roman Empire, but it still happened to be stoned. For, for, for two, two reasons, right? Um, a, she got pregnant, right? Out of wedlock, so to speak. Um, technically, why she was married, forgive me. Um, but also for blasphemy. She said she got pregnant by God? Excuse me? She could have been stoned. However, Joseph chooses the path of mercy. He was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, but he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Think about this, and I want you to see this. Before any divine explanation, Joseph chooses mercy. No anger. No. Uh, this really challenges me. Anyone else in here a venter? Raise your hand if you like to vent. Thank you for being honest. I'm a venter. I vent it all out, I deal with it, I circle back, I finally get right with it. I'm a vent. No anger, no outrage, no venting. He certainly could have asked a lot of questions. Mary, how could you do, to, do this to me? Who's the father? 
But no words are recorded. All we see is tenderness. He's going to be the talk of Nazareth for all the wrong reasons. Friends are going to make snide comments, but he wouldn't hurt Mary no matter what he thought she had done to him. When he could have demanded a vengeful vengeful silence, instead he chooses a righteous mercy. I got to be honest, I've never taken the time uh, in teaching about Christmas, and I've done it for 30 years, just to teach on on Joseph, because he's just that forgotten character. He just doesn't have many parts. But as I thought about this, I'm like, what can I learn from Joseph's example of righteousness? And I know that none of us have ever um, been in a position quite like Joseph's, but We've all been wronged by another person. We all know what it's like to be hurt or or offended. Here's the question. I want to ask this to you. How do you react when you've been wronged? Ruth and I um, have met with couples for over 30 years. And um, and what we often hear is, "But, but he or she has wronged me. Hey, that's not what I expected. Do you think that's what Joseph expected? He signed the papers for the Kiddushin. Oh, it's going to be so good. The families came together. They agreed on a price. I'm working hard as a carpenter, as a stoneman. Yes. We often hear, but she or he has, has, has wronged me. And not to oversimplify, but please hear this. Um, sometimes we can just choose mercy. Even if we've been, been wronged, we can forgive and choose mercy. While we were yet sinners, we wronged God. Jesus what? Chose mercy and died for us. I know it's so un-American. Right now, some of you are uncomfortable. Right now, some of you are uncomfortable right now sitting in your seats next to your spouse because you're like, he wronged me and I'm going to get him. She lied and I'm going to... Can you choose mercy? Mercy? Joseph is an example of this. One of Joseph's other sons, who would one day grow up to believe in his older brother, Jesus, wrote these words. James chapter 3 and verse 17. But the wisdom that that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving. You're like, well, I want to have the wisdom of God in my marriage, in my life, in my singleness, at the workplace. Here you go. Here's God's wisdom. It's pure, it's peace-loving, it's considerate, it's submissive, it's what? It's full of mercy. Good fruit. It's impartial and it's sincere. This righteous carpenter would raise God's son. He has a part to play. This is part of Jesus' humanity to be a merciful Savior. You can just imagine, now we don't know, but we can presuppose all those years of of Joseph passing on his trade to his son Jesus, side by side. This righteous man exemplifying mercy to Jesus. Second observation, um, just a sidebar here, but I think it's really important because the text kind of demands it. God is actually um, really, really um, with us. He's with us. Verse 20, but after he had considered this, uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because she, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people um, from their sins. Verse 22, and this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. That's Isaiah, Isaiah chapter seven and verse 14. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And, and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God, God with us. This is amazing. 
As, as we just read, uh, one of the names, one of the many names given to Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God is actually in our midst. And what the Bible is saying is, is stunning. That when Jesus was born, it was nothing less than God coming right to where we're at. Now, if we think of the world as a broken down house, um, which by the way, that'd be a nice um, kind of a nice example, right? Because it's so much worse than that. If we think of the world as, as a broken, broken down house, um, we need to let this truth sink in. And I want you to see behind me. God moved in to our broken down house. He moved into our mess. He didn't condemn it. He didn't start over. He didn't write it off. He entered it. He comes in our flesh. He comes into our humanity, into our vulnerability, into our history, into our, our reality. I have another quote. It's long, but it's really good by the late Timothy Keller. And he says this. He says, the doctrine of the incarnation is through the womb of Mary that the world we all know about came in. Through the pitiless slab, the pitiless walls of the world, God punched a hole and he punched the hole and he came in. The ideal became real. The impossible became possible. The supernatural became natural. The metaphysical became physical. More than that, the powerful became powerless. The invulnerable became vulnerable. The unapproachable became huggable. The immense became a single cell. The unassailably remote became God with us. That's the incarnation. There is nothing like that. Nobody has ever made a claim like that. But why? Why would God enter into our broken house? Why would he come into our world? The true story is told about um, two Italians and two Germans who were climbing the 6,000 foot near vertical north face of what, what's called the, the Eiger in the Swiss Alps. Here's a, a picture. It's a little more daunting than that. That looks almost friendly. It's not. Um, the two German climbers disappeared, never to be seen again. By the way, why do people climb mountains? That's crazy. Because <laughs> they're there. All right, whatever. <sighs> so the two German climbers, the four climbers, two Germans, two Italians, they're trying to go up this thing. At this time in history, in the late 50s, only 12 climbers had ever climbed it. Two of the German climbers disappear and are never seen again. The two Italian climbers, they are exhausted and literally they're dying and they're stuck on um, two narrow ledges a thousand feet below the summit. The Swiss Al Alpine Club um, didn't allow rescue att attempts in this area. It was buyer beware. There's no helicopters, there's no way. To, they're like, hey, if you do this, we're not gonna rescue you if you get stuck, you're gonna die. But a small group of Swiss climbers decided to launch a private rescue effort to save the Italians. So they carefully lowered a climber down the 6,000-foot six foot north face. They suspended him on a cable a fraction of an inch as they lowered him into the abyss. Here's how he described the rescue, which was a successful rescue, rescue in his own words. He said, and I quote, as I was lowered down the summit, my comrades on top grew further and further distant until they disappeared from sight. At this moment, I felt an indescribable aloneness. Then for the first time, I peered down the abyss of the north face of the Eiger. The terror of the sight robbed me of breath. The brooding blackness of the face falling away in almost endless expanse beneath me made me look with awful longing to the thin cable disappearing about me in the midst. He says this, I was a tiny human being dangling in space between heaven and hell. The sole relief from terror was this, my mission to save the climber below. Beloved, that's the heart of the gospel story. You and I were standing on that ledge. And nobody can save us. We're trapped, but in the person and the presence of Jesus, God, God, not some lackey, not some other angel, not Moses, 
God lowered himself into the abyss of our sin and our suffering, and Jesus, God, became a tiny human being dangling between heaven and hell for you, for me. Thus, the gospel is much more radical than just another religion telling us how to be good in our own power. It tells us the story of God's risky, costly, sacrificial rescue effort on your behalf and mine. This is the incredible great news of Christmas. Hey, can a brother get a Hallmark movie? Hallelujah. Kiss under the mistletoe. That's cool. How about some more eggnog? I'm all in, right? A little more ham, some more presents. Like right now the Amazon trucks are just coming to my door. It feels like every day. I'm like, come on. That's not Christmas. The greatest privilege, the thing we were made for, is presence. To experience the presence of God. Our sin made that impossible, but God has taken action to fix that. How? He came in the flesh. He is Emmanuel. He pitched his tent in our mess. He's God with us. Third observation. Last observation. Joseph was a righteous man. Joseph was an obedient man. Verse 20, after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Did you, did you catch that? If that's me, I'm getting a dream interpretation. Dude, I had some roasted lamb last night. I was, I was freaking out. This angel, you got, I need an interpretation. Do you notice that? Joseph obeys without hesitation. He understood clearly what God expected of him, and he was ready to obey. He would take Mary to be his wife, um, and he would suffer the hurtful remarks of a child conceived prior to the wedding. He would obey in spite of the fact that this child of divine promise would be born under a cloud of adultery. Years later, rabbis would write that Jesus was a bastard. It lingered for a long, long time. He called his adopted son Jesus just as he was told to do. Joseph believed God and he obeyed him. Later, Joseph takes Mary and the infant Jesus to Egypt. He leaves behind his business, his carpentry business. He leaves family and friends to obey God and go to Egypt. He did as he was commanded. Jo Joseph's story reminds us that faith, I want us to hear this, always requires a first step of obedience. Joseph had to take God at his word. He had to believe the message of the angel and go forward with his marriage to Mary, even though he had no way to prove that the message was true. That's usually the way faith works. Faith means taking God at his word and acting on it. Hey, sometimes we get to see, right? We're like, oh, you did this. I saw it. Great. Other times we go, I, I, I don't know. Show of hands. Who was there when Jesus resurrected? Anyone? That'd be a little freaky if someone raised their hand, but you get the point. You're like, well, I believe it by what? By faith. Practically. Um, for you and me, it may be, um, it, I want us to get us a, kind of a, a list of these. Can we get those up there? Asking for the elders of the church to pray for your healing, even though you feel silly. You're like, I know James chapter 5, go to the elders, be anointed with oil, pray for heal. I know what it says, but I just feel maybe that's what God's asking you to do. 
Maybe it's um, beginning a conversation about Jesus with someone, even though you wonder if you'll be mocked, um, canceled, or you won't even know what to say. You just got to say, God, give me the words to say at the right time to the right person. Maybe it's making the visit to the person God seems to be prompting you to visit, even though you don't know why he's prompting you to do that. Maybe it's um, forgiving someone, even though you're afraid of being hurt, hurt again. You fill in the blank. What's in your life right now that God is wanting for you to step out in obedience and trust him with it? Parents, maybe you've got some adult children and uh, you need to go get things right with them. You just need to go, hey, I wasn't a perfect mom or dad. I did my best. We tried to raise you up in the admonition of the Lord, but here's some mistakes that we made. I just want to apologize for that. Children, maybe you need to go to your parents and go, hey, I've been hard on you. Man, social media doesn't help. My expectations of you, mom and dad, are so ridiculously high. I know you can't meet them, and yet I judge you. Forgive me for that. I need to show you mercy like Joseph did. Maybe it's a career choice. I I don't know. You know, right right now in your heart of hearts, um, there's potentially a step of obedience that you need to take, and you're like, God, help me to do it. Faith is proved by our actions. Uh, More words from the brother of Jesus. James chapter 2 and verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and, and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what, um, what good is it? Verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Isn't it funny what the enemy has done? All over social media, it's like, I posted this. I put this up. I thought this. I said this. But did you do it? No, because thinking it and saying it and posting it's the same thing. No, it's not. Tell that to a hungry person. Tell that to a person who has no shelter. It's not the same thing. At this time, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come on up. For those of you who are new to New Heights, you may have noticed um, around the room, we have tables with little glasses of grape juice, of wine, and bread. That's what we call communion, what the Bible calls communion, what we call our communion time. Here in just a few minutes, you'll have an opportunity to take communion, to celebrate Jesus' coming, his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Sometimes we forget in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, as you take this, he says, remember his return. He literally says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So every time I take communion, I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Rescue us again from this broken down house. As, as um, Nathan said, off to our right, there'll be some elders and wives and they would love to pray for you, maybe even anoint you with oil for healing, uh, physical, emotional healing. People around this room wanna pray for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, oh, wow. I'm on the ledge. I get it. Either I've been trying to rescue myself and I'm like the the Germans, I'm perishing. Or maybe you're like, I'm on the ledge and for the first time, Christmas isn't about a Hallmark movie or ham and yams, right? It's about Jesus, the rescuer. And he came to rescue me. And you want to tell somebody that. And you want to talk about what does it mean to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. The real reason for this season. Do it today. Maybe you want to be baptized. It's why our team, as you saw in the video, faithfully set this up every single week. Because they're so passionate about what it means to celebrate new birth. To come up out of that water as a new creation and say, "I'm I'm a Christ follower. Well, um, it wouldn't be Advent without a little responsive reading. 
uh, a little liturgy. So let's finish this talk together as we, as we ponder this amazing season. So I'm the leader. We don't do this very often. Um, so we're a little awkward and that's okay. We, we practice with the giving prayer. I'm the leader, at least for today I'm the leader. And you're the follower, you're the people. So we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do my part and then you do your part and say it loud. As we prepare our house for the coming Christmas season, we would also prepare our hearts for the returning Christ. Though there was no room at the inn to receive you upon your first arrival, as we decorate and celebrate, we do so to mark the memory of your redemptive movement into our broken world, O oh God. Our glittering ornaments and Christmas trees, our festive carols and sumptuous feasts. That God, on a particular night, in a particular place, so many years ago, was born to us, an infant king, our prince of peace, our wreaths and ribbons and color lights, our giving of gifts, our parties with friends, these have never been ends in themselves. In view of such great tidings of love announced to us and to all people, how can we not be moved to praise and celebration in this Christmas season? We are making ready to receive the one who has already, with open arms, received us. Now we celebrate your first coming, Emmanuel, even as we long for your return. <laughs>